Good morning. Welcome to the Foundation Church this morning. Special welcome to those who are in the sanctuary. Hi, Carol. How are you? And to all those watching online on the, on the stream this morning. Stand with us this morning. Let's sing our song of welcome and celebration together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Stand with us. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you I lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. High and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. to see you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. You may have a seat for a little bit. Welcome this morning um, to the Foundation Church. Glad to see all of you here, all your smiling faces. I want to welcome those who are with us online too. We're glad that you are here with us as well. Uh, we have a special day today, a day that we're celebrating all the graduates we have here. And we also have Harvest Stand Ministries here, which you'll hear about a little bit later. But one of the first things I want to say, so um, Elaine doesn't get mad, is that... <laughs> Tonight, from 5 to 7, we are having uh, the barbecue, barbecue cookout um, at the lake. And at the Next Steps table, there's a flyer for it, and it shows the address. So um, that way you can find where you need to go. And it's not too late to sign up yet and bring a lawn chair to sit in. Also today, we have, like I said, Harvest Stand Ministries here. Um, and... On Saturday, June 26, we have an opportunity for, uh, for us to partner with Harvest Stand Ministries and to serve them. Um, and Jordan Palladino is here this morning, but before I invite him up to talk about that, um, we have a video to show on that. So can you play that video now, please? The need in our community is probably far greater than most people think. Um, there's a lot of families who are struggling um, with uh, lower income, that they're unstable housing and um, jobs that just aren't supporting their families and they have children and the children are hungry and we're supplying those that food for that and the clothing that they need 
and just the support that they need to know that somebody cares and can help them get beyond where they are. I had lost my mother in January of 2012 and knew that I needed to do something to fill the time that I would normally spend with her and um, it was in the church bulletin and it was like almost specific of the time and the day on that Monday that I would normally always stay be with her and um, they needed volunteer help and I'd never done any volunteer work like this before and so I came down and so I've been here ever since. When someone comes to Harvesty and Ministries, um, we find out what their situation is and what their needs are and if we can meet those needs or if we need to refer them to someone else. Um, but we just hear their story and try to help in any way that we can help. And especially if it's with the food and clothing assistance, then um, we can definitely do that. And the need right that day might be only those things, but then we find the underlying needs are um, more stable work and housing and things like that. And then um, within the ministry, we have uh, resources to, to get them through those, to help them to get to a better place to where they can provide. What it means for me to volunteer at Harvesting Ministries is just um, first of all, a greater awareness uh, of the need in our community and then just a better understanding and compassion for the people who are going through that need and um, relationship with them and especially rewarding to see them get through to the other side to where they're, they're stable and they're back on top of things and to see those same people come back in then with bags of groceries and wanting to donate back to us because they appreciate um, and realize how much we were there for them and they want to do the same for someone else um, going through the same things. All right, I'd like to invite Jordan up here now to talk a little bit more about the ministry. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. It is a good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you today. And I am just honored and grateful that I have the opportunity to worship with you this morning and to talk a little bit about what we do at Harvest Stand. I think the video uh, did a decent job in showing what our facilities look like and a little bit about what we do. At Harvest Stand, we are responding to human need with the love of Christ. So what we try to do is to enter into our clients' lives and relate to them and walk with them through whatever struggles and whatever situations that they and their families are experiencing. And so the things that we focus on at Harvest Stand are coming alongside of people. Respect, dignity, hospitality, and just love and compassion. So I think you saw it a little bit in the video. We try to have a very clean and well-run facility that is well-stocked, and it's something that looks similar to what you would see in a grocery store because we think that is something that's important to our clients and our relationships with them, that we can show love to them and Christ loves to them Well, we just walk with them through their current situation. So, like we were talking about, I want to invite you to an opportunity to help us out with our biggest uh, food drive of the year. 98% of the food that we get is donated at Harvest Stand, and so on Saturday, June 26th, we are having our post office drive, which is everybody in Zealand is getting a postcard to leave donated food outside of, by their mailbox, and all of the post men and women are going to pick that up and then bring it to Harvest Stand. So for about six hours, we are going to get post truck after post truck coming through and donating food. I've been told it's incredible to see. I haven't seen it before. This is my first time, so if you come join me, we'll all see it together. It'll be a learning experience for everybody. So we could really use help. At Harvest Stand, we get, on average per year, 100 to 150,000 pounds of food donated. At the post office drive, we will get somewhere between 10 and 15,000 pounds of food donated. So anywhere from 10 to 15% of all of the food we will get for the entire year is going to come in on Saturday, June 26. 
So if you've ever wondered what five to seven tons of food looks like, you have the opportunity to find out. Exactly, yeah. I'm challenging you. I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity to be challenged. So I would love for any of you to join me to see a little bit more about what the ministry is about. I would love to stand up here and tell you stories about the ministry and what we are doing in people's lives, but I was told I have five to six minutes, and I think I'm already over it. So if you have any questions, Suzanne will be in the back. There is the sign-up. If you have any questions for me, I'll be hanging around after service, so feel free to come up and talk to me. It's really awkward when I'm in the back and no one talks to me, so please come up and at least say hi, because then it's less awkward for everybody. So thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate being here, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in a couple weeks. Jordan, I believe that uh, the way that we can help, the sign-up list has two shifts on it. So for three and a half hours, you'll volunteer your time. So take, take a look at that list back there and sign up. We need about 18 to 20 people total. So let's, let's do our job and do something good for Harvest Day. Okay. Yeah, and it'll be a great opportunity to serve. So um, again, that's Saturday, June 26th. And we got uh, a lot of other things going on around that time, too, that I want to quickly plug. So Sunday, June 27, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be walking the neighborhood. And that's to promote our summer picnic, which is on uh, June 30. So that's going to be Sunday, June 27. Um, well, we'll be having pizza with that as well. So um, you can come for that. It's good incentive. We're having it after we walk the neighborhood, though. So... Um, kind of have to walk before you eat the pizza. So, <laughs> um, and then with that again, our summer picnic is June 30. So mark your calendars. This will be a great outreach event. Um, we want to reach people in this church, and it's another great opportunity, and for all of us to serve in that as well. There's sign-up sheets to help serve, as well as for Wild Wednesdays. And Wild Wednesdays is on July 7 through August 11. And it's another great opportunity for everyone in this church to serve. There's a place for everyone to help out. And I encourage us all to do it because as a whole church, we can accomplish great and awesome things. And as we see here, there's so many good things going on. So I encourage you to, si sh uh, sorry, to sign up for that as well. And then the last thing that I want to plug is we always want to connect with people. So um, if you're new here, it's one of your first times visiting and you haven't done yet, uh, fill out a Connect card, which is in the, the back seats of the chairs in front of you, and bring that to the Next Steps table after the service. And for those of you online, if this is your first time, we'll have an online Connect card in the description as well. So thank you. Now I ask that you stand as we continue to worship God and sing to him. Empty hands held high, such small sacrifice. If not joy in my life, I sing in vain tonight. May the words I say and the things I do make my life song sing, bring a smile to you. Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart is true. Let my life song sing to you. Give my life a living sacrifice to reach a world in need, to be your hands and feet. So may the words I say and the things I do make my life song sing, bring a smile to you. 
Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart was true. Let my life song sing to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, let my life song sing to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, let my life song sing to you. sign your name to the end of this day knowing that my heart was true let my life song sing to you
come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms. Praise God. Just as I am, praise God, just as I am. You may be seated. At this time, we're going to go to um, God in prayer, but a couple quick prayer requests to highlight um, that I found out right before the service. So Priscilla, who is Aaron and Jeremiah's mother, um, has recently been um, put into the ICU. She's been really sick, so let's pray for her um, for healing. And then also, uh, Pastor Dave let me know that he is a good friend, and some of you know this know who he is as well, but Craig Brace um, recently had a, a little stroke. Um, he's likely to recover from it, but it's really scary still, and pray for healing for him as well, and we'll pray for that now as well. So at this time, let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, I want to thank you for the sun that's shining this morning. I want to thank you for being here with us um, as we sing, as we worship you, um, as we hear your word proclaimed later. Um, Lord, thank you for giving us a place to come and to worship you together as one body and one church. And Lord, uh, we have some prayer requests this morning to lift up to you. We pray for Priscilla, Aaron, and Jeremiah's mother who has been really sick and is in the ICU right now. Lord, we pray that um, she may be healed completely. Send your healing hand on her and work in the, the doctors and the nurses as they care for her. And may she make a complete recovery. And Lord, we also lift up Craig Brace. Um, we pray that you send comfort to him and healing to him. And may he make a complete recovery as well. And Lord, I have another prayer request to lift up that I just found out. I want to lift up a young man who has recently um, been released from jail after serving his time and found out that he can no longer live where he had planned. Lord, that is a scary situation. I ask that you provide for him a place to, to live um, so he can get that security and that comfort. And Lord, this morning um, we continue to pray for um, our graduates. Lord, uh, there's a special prayer that I have here for our graduates, and we ask that you help our graduates to walk in your wisdom and grace. We pray for spiritual eyes and discernment in all things. Help them to be wise leaders and influencers in this generation, not conformed to the world, but transformed by your power. Lord, we ask that you would equip them with all that they need to make a difference for your purposes. Help them to live as salt and light in a dark world that so desperately needs to know your truth. Lord, we ask for your power to help them to walk continually in honesty and integrity. Build within them a deep godliness that they would be more concerned about their character than their reputation. Lord, we pray that they would seek to bring honor to you throughout their lives, that they would have a vision and heart for the world. Extend their boundaries and give them incredible influence with people and nations, and make their hearts and spirits open to every plan and purpose you have for them, and to be willing to boldly go wherever you call them. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. So good to hear that our um, local 
pantry and ministry is under some really good quality leadership with you, Jordan. Thanks for coming this morning and, and uh, providing some smiles and some glimpse of hope for our community because we love um, to gather food here in the hallway from time to time for that ministry and, um, and other ministries as well. So um, today we're doing what's called a Graduate Sunday. We do it every year. It's something that we love to do. We like to honor our graduates. And I know a lot, a lot of the graduates could make it here today due to all well, the time of year and the, the, the uh, things that are going on uh, with the graduates. But some have come today. And so what we'd like to do is I'd like to read a list. And I'd like to, um, I had a special prayer made as well. But, um, you know, communication's a really important thing, right? And I should have communicated with Jason. Jason had a far better prayer than I could have made, so I'm going to forego that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to list off the graduates. And um, what I'd like the graduates to do is to uh, come forward, the ones that are here today. I'd also like to invite Lacey to come up today. Uh, Lacey worked with, um, of course, the, the uh, youth group and some of these people she has built into. And so I'm going to have her come up and help to uh, hand out some of the gift bags. We have a gift bag for each one. And if your graduate is not here today, but you are, uh, take that gift bag uh, home for them and uh, give it to them from the church because we love them. So here's a list. Um, high school graduates, we have Trevor Burry. We have Angie Van Horn, Keegan Genzink, uh, Spencer Parrish, Lydia Vanderlaan, and Dirk Rietveld. Will you guys come up? And then also from college, we have Brandon Burry, Lacey Burry, Brandon DeBoer, Lucas Van Heest, Chloe Van Heest, myself, and then also we included a couple that, you know, last year was a tough year, right? So uh, we want to uh, shout out uh, for Kennedy Genzink and also for Emily Holst, who graduated last year but were able to finally walk this year. And so uh, why don't you uh, come up if I listed all of you, and then Lacey is here. Okay. And um, we want, what's that? Oh, the gift bags are right over here. And so we'll just walk our way that way. So congratulations, guys. It's been a hard-fought battle for you. And um, I know that some of you know what you're going to do in the future. Some of you don't have a clue what you're going to do in the future yet, and that's fine. Um, but what we're doing here is a morning, this morning from church is to let you know that we uh, love you guys and that we're proud of you guys and we thank God for you guys. We made a special... Uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation that's, um, that's scrolling here that tells all the information that you guys gave to the office as well as your picture. And so um, this is Trevor Burry. Uh, Trevor graduated from West Ottawa High School on May 27. He'll be attending Grand Rapids Community College in the fall. Also continue working at Dee's Auto and Transmission. And if you uh, see the car he drives around with, it, what it started with and what it is now, he's got a great future because he's got it on the road. And not only that, it's wonderful. And then we have uh, Dirk Rietveld. Dirk was grad graduated from Zeeland West High School with honors. He's taking the next year off to work and save money for college. He's going to attend also Grand Rapids Community College to study psychology, followed by the police academy at Grand Valley State University. He plans to eventually join the Grand Rapids Police Department. Thank you, Dirk. A good calling, both of you. And Keegan as well. Keegan uh, Genzink uh, graduated um, from Holland High School, and I'm not one that notices details, but we spelled you right in the small lettering and not in the big lettering, but that's okay. We know who Keegan is. Uh, Keegan graduated from Holland Christian High School on May 25. He's planning to attend Grand Valley State University in the fall. He's going to major in business and marketing, and he's looking forward to living on campus. This summer, he'll be working at Crazy Horse and also starting at the Butler. The Butler in Saugatuck? Nice. Very cool. We also um, want to uh, thank God for, for Spencer as well as Lydia, and there's the high schools that they graduated from. Now we have Lucas and Chloe. 
Lucas graduated with a farm pharmacy doctorate, master's in business administration from Ferris State University. Chloe graduated as a nurse practitioner with a degree as a nurse practitioner from St. Francis College. Uh, they married on May 14. And have they already uh, traveled? Um, oh, they're traveling today. So they're traveling to California where where Chloe is going to be a traveling nurse for a few months as um, Lucas studies for his boards. So that's a busy couple, and uh, make sure you pray for them uh, in their travels and as well. Lacey Burry, Lacey graduated from Grand Valley State University with a Master of Social Work degree. She started working as a case manager at Network 180. It's a brand new job. In fact, a, a brand new job that's... Um, She's looking forward to study. Have you started yet, Lacey? You've started already. Good. Kent County's Community Mental Health Organization. I know how busy you are uh, due to the amount of people I've seen referred there and all the good things I've heard about that place. That's a great, great first job. Good work. Kennedy Genzink graduated from Calvin University in 2020 with a BA in Human Resource Management. Her graduation ceremony was held on May 22. Following an internship this past summer, she was offered a position at ITW Draw Form in Zealand as a, spe as a uh, human resources specialist coordinator. So she got her job that she was looking for. Congratulations, Kennedy. Emily Hulst, is, uh, she graduated from Calvin University in 2020 with a bachelor's degree in biology. She's moving to Auburn Hills, Michigan in October after her wedding to Grant Vanderlaan. She'll then look for a job in her field. That's a beautiful place to live and to work. I know very well that area of Auburn Hills. Brandon Burry graduated from Cornerstone University with a BS in marketing. Brandon will be going into ministry with Youth Dynamics Adventures in Idaho. Brandon met with me last week regarding fundraising for his position there, and he'll be also meeting with many of you. And um, this is an individual that I can say that if you're going to invest in any young person, this would be one to do. And, um, and so make sure that you uh, thank the Lord for Brandon, his work, and his job. And we have Brandon DeBoer. Brandon DeBoer graduated from the University of Florida with a master's in business administration and a concentration in marketing. We have a lot of marketers in this church. Did you know that? So uh, he will be joining the commercial and sales leadership development program at Baker Hughes starting in Houston, Texas this summer. So it's going to get a little bit warmer for you, isn't it, huh? Yeah, it's going to be really good, though. And so who's that cat? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so, I uh, didn't get my information in the time, <laughs> so, it looks like, so, so, yeah, so, but you hear enough from me, so that's, that's good enough, um, you know, so I graduated with a counseling degree, and um, I look forward to practicing that here, both in the congregation, as well as outside, and um, it's going to enhance my job as a pastor, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity the Lord gave me to do that over five years. And so to all of you, is there anybody else? Is that the end? Okay. So to all of you, we want to thank you. This is a, uh, schooling is something that um, pretty much has to be done across the board, no matter what it is. And uh, it's something that um, you guys have done a really good job at. And it's something that I believe that the Lord is going to give you an incredible, incredible future at uh, wherever he places you. And some of you have already been placed. Some of you have yet to be placed. And um, Lacey um, has been our youth director, like I said, and she's going to help hand out because she's built into the life of, of these youth. And um, so we're going to have you all come over here. And one thing I know because you're bright students is that the minimum thing you learned was to read and so your name is on the outside of your bag why don't you um come over the boys are in blue the girls are in white and um let's see this brandon and trevor all right congratulations guys congratulations keegan you find yours there, Lacey? 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> People of God, I want to um, start this morning to imagine a nightmare scenario. Now, you heard some of this message, well, parts of this character last summer when we talked about the judges. But today we're going to couch that story into our present series, which is How to Avoid a Plunge to Disaster. And the guy that we're going to talk about today, his name is Samson. Samson, I want you to see, is probably not someone that's strolling out of the back room just putting on his, his shorts and his muscle shirt and comes strolling into the gym and he's all like no neck, you know, and whenever he reaches up to scratch his head, the air displacement from his muscles knocks somebody over. You know, I mean, we all look at Samson, we see the pictures and he's always got like a 12-pack, you know, and he's all strong. I want you to vision Samson as yourself. Um, for me, it would be a soft 55-year-old guy who couldn't believe he rode in the iron butt motorcycle thing yesterday and made it. Um, for you, maybe it's somebody that's not even 100 pounds. Maybe you're a male, maybe you're a female. Maybe, it's, maybe you're um, someone that is over 70, maybe over 80. And I want you to vision yourself doing the things that Samson did in his life. Because I believe that Samson was a regular Nazarite man that the Holy Spirit came upon and gave him his strength to do things. So when you hear of him grabbing the city gates, lifting them out of the ground, and carrying them miles up the road, that could be you. That could be me. Because the Holy Spirit is co-eternal God. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's God, just like God is God, and Jesus is God, the forgotten man that we don't talk about a lot, and uh, the Holy Spirit is just the same God and can empower anybody to do anything. And if you have plunged yourself to disaster, if you're on your way to plunge yourself to disaster, I want to say that the Holy Spirit can come upon you and deliver you from that, from the effects of that, from the guilt and shame of that, or even deliver it before it happens. And so there's our strength today, as it always is, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a nightmare scenario I want you to recognize and think about today. Imagine it in your mind. We've been all so used to the freedoms that we have. We have a lot of freedom. We, can, we woke up this morning, and I doubt anybody here thought about, except for maybe our security team, thought about the possibility that someone could come here and take our freedom away to worship. You didn't even think about that. Neither did I. And we enjoy it, and we take it for granted. But I want you to imagine that there's some tanks rolling up into Washington, D.C. right now. I want you to imagine the unthinkable scenario where a foreign power has invaded our country and these tanks are being shipped into place, they're being flown into place, and we are no longer a free people. In fact, someone said that down 8th Street, those tanks are rolling down the street right now between our businesses and our beautiful road that's heated for the winter so that we can walk without snow and ice. Every day we hear atrocities committed by the military in the streets against defenseless people on their way to work. Of course, various attempts of resistance have been made, some by members of this congregation, but you know what? We never heard from them again or saw them. This is an imagination, right? I did say that, right? So gradually over time, those of you that want to resist... Well, those thoughts kind of crumble. People begin to accept the unthinkable and lose hope of ever regaining your freedom. And that's the nightmare scenario that applied to God's people in the beginning of Judges 13. 
Judges 13 says that the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Think of that. That's a whole generation. Whole generation. There was no king in Israel. There was no organized resistance movement. They were completely helpless against these Philistines. And because they forgot about God again, God says, well, I guess you got to remember God again. And they, he delivered them again into the hands of the enemies for a while. This time for 40 years. Think about what that means. You try to picture your children. You, you try to picture your grandchildren growing up in a, in a period of 40 years. All they'd ever known is tanks in the streets. And now you're seeing them at 25 and 28 and 38 and 39 and 40 years old. And you wonder, will they ever know what it's like to be free? Are they ever going to be delivered so they can live the freedom that we experienced and loved? Is there any hope on the horizon? And I want to say that God heard the call of his people again. And one of the ways he heard that call was he delivered a judge. He delivered a man whose name was Samson. He raised him up for the purpose of delivering his people and I want you to know a few things about Samson, this character, before we get into the story uh, so you can get to know this guy. The first thing is that Samson was a believer. I, I say he's a believer because the New Testament specifically says that he was a man of faith. In fact, you find him in the, in the famous faith chapter. Even though he took a real big plunge to disaster, he made all these tons of mistakes in his life, uh, he still was found in Hebrews 11 in the book of the faith chapter chapter. And um, he's there with David. He's there with Samuel and Gideon as those who administered justice and, and conquered uh, kingdoms through faith. He was a man of faith. But secondly, God made it clear before Samson was born he was to be set apart for God's work in his world. So he's set apart. Judges 13 verse 5 says this boy is to be a Nazarite. He's to be set apart from birth. He will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So it says that right in Judges 13. Now that bit of being Nazarite is, is somewhat unusual. Um, a Nazarite takes a vow where they won't have their hair cut. They won't touch an alcoholic drink ever. And... Um, they would abstain from lots of different things. They're not going to come into contact with a dead body or, or any type of uh, carcass. They would be cer ceremonial clean and pure so they can continuously be in the presence of God. This is a Nazarite. This is what Samson grew up with. He was set apart. And it was usually for a period of time for a specific purpose. Um, Unlike any other middle school or high school college student, his mother probably never once said to him, uh, you got to go to a barber and get a haircut, right? I mean, this is not someone that you would have heard that said to because that was part of it. They never cut his hair. Throughout his life, his hair grew and became just really sweet like Trevor's hair is, you know, and uh, Brandon's was and until he needed to go interview for his job. <laughs> yeah. I'm jealous because I can't grow hair like that, Trevor. Notice the third thing. He was gifted. He was set apart from God, but he was really gifted by the Holy Spirit. Chapter uh, 13 in Judges, verse 24, says that the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Now, it's the Spirit, like I said, that gave him this remarkable strength. It was the Spirit that carried his mission through. It's the Spirit that is going to carry our graduates through life. It's the Spirit that's going to carry you as your graduates leave the home and you become empty nesters. It's going to be that Spirit that lifts you up and gives you the strength. And even when your kids do some just crazy things into the future and you wonder, what in the world are they doing? It's the Spirit that's going to heal that in your life and give you the comfort you need and strength. Fourthly, um, he was a courageous hero. This is not, um, you know, I mentioned that it could be any one of us, and that's true. But this guy was a courageous hero. He was larger than life, and um, he gave hope in a desperate situation that people found themselves in. And extraordinary results. We read about him taking a thousand Philistine lives 
with the jawbone of a donkey. I preached a little a couple weeks ago about Balaam. Maybe it was his donkey, you know, but um, any one of the donkeys that got the jawbone and um, killed a thousand Philistines. A thousand Philistines, think of that. And um, I don't think it's, we're supposed to stroke our chins and pull long faces and say, oh dear, what moral problems there are in the Old Testament killing all these people. I think we're supposed to cheer we found a hero who's prepared to face the enemy, to deliver God's people, and God raised him up, and he became a one-man army when his whole nation was otherwise just defenseless. So I want you to understand Samson properly. Start from what the Bible tells us. A spiritually gifted believer, set apart for God, empowered by the Holy Spirit for a special hero task that God would give to him. And there's one more thing we need to know about Samson this morning as we place ourselves into his life. It's not so flattering. That's that Samson was an irresponsible fool. That's the great irony of this guy's life. Here's a man with godly parents, spiritual gifts, extraordinary courage, greatly used by God, and at times we see he does the most stupid things. So as we follow the story of Samson this morning, sometimes we don't know if we're supposed to be cheering for this guy or if we're supposed to feel sorry for him, right? And you know, think of your own life. There's times where we have cheered about lots of things that we've done. There's times that we thought, what an irresponsible fool I've been. And I want to say that we can find ourselves in the story of Samson just like we find ourselves in the story of all these characters we talk about each and every week. So listen on. Because I think that you've seen this contradiction. If you haven't, you don't live in the same world as, as me. And it's, re, it's, it's possible to have all these gifts and be an irresponsible fool. So turn to the story on the screen. You'll read with me. And use your imagination to picture Samson. He must be a man who attracts attention wherever he goes. He commands attention. He's probably got long, flowing hair. He's probably a man that... Um, gets what he wants, as we see in the story today. A man who asks for what he wants, a man who gets what he wants, a man who's probably a type A personality, and he's carrying this reputation that this is someone you don't cross swords with. He's a man of God with amazing strength. Judges 14, verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and there he saw a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. His mother and father replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must she go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now, his parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. Samson went down to Timnah uh, together with his mother and father. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat apart. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with a woman, and he liked her. It's kind of funny. Finally, he talks with her, right? Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass along the road. In it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and he ate as he went along. And when he rejoined his parents, he gave them some and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from a lion's carcass. 
Now his father went down to see the woman, and there Samson held a feast, as was customary for young men. When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within seven days of this feast, I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. But if you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. So Samson replied, Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they couldn't give the answer. On the fourth day, they went to Samson's wife and, and said, coax your husband into explaining this riddle for us. Or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to steal our property? Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, You hate me. You really don't love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, Samson replied. So why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her, because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to Samson, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, boy, this is a way to talk about your brand new wife, isn't it? Wow. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, gave their clothes to those who explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. Means he left his wedding. Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. So here's this Old Testament man. He's walking down uh, to the place called Timnah. There's um, beginning of chapter 14 where we're told that he sees this Philistine woman. She must have been a stunner. He come back and said, I got to have her. Get her for me as a wife, dad and mom. There's no one like her that I've ever seen. Samson wanted to do the right thing in getting married just for all the wrong reasons. And... Um, he didn't even know this woman. It wasn't until later that he even spoke to her. But he had to have what he had to have. All he knew was what he saw. And of course, mom and dad were absolutely horrified by that, weren't they? You know, they had pictured for their son to marry in his own people group and to marry the one of dad's own choosing and, and of course, mom as well. And, um, and Furthermore, the Philistines are the ones that have been taken, they took captive of Israel. That was the enemy. And he wants to marry one of them, right? How can you possibly marry the enemy, Samson? Are you out of the control that bad? And he said, get her for me. She's the right one. And then there's this parenthesis in the Bible that says they did not know that this was the Lord's plan to encounter the Philistines and subtext through Samson. But talk about a strong-willed child. He's so smitten, he's not listening to anybody else. And that's a large step down the road to disaster, isn't it? When you stop listening to other people. When you start isolating yourself away from your friends and those who can give you good advice and, 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 and don't go to help. Because that's what anxious and depressed people do. They don't want to be a burden on anybody. They can't even think about what's happening in themselves. And if they can withdraw because they're losing relationships because of where their mental health is, they, they can withdraw away from that, and then they don't have to lose any more relationships, and they don't ask for help anymore. Samson did not ask mom and dad, what do you think about this? He's just smitten. And 
I think that there's probably some parents here to have sought to raise a child or raise a grandchild that God's given to you, poured yourself into them, and you're just watching them just go down a wrong path, and they have their will of their own, and they're, they're walking that way, and you just can see the pain that's coming, and there's nothing you can do about it. They're just going to do what they're going to do, and no amount of punishment, no amount of um, taking them out of the things that they like to do as a way of punishment. It helps. They just are strong-willed. And if that's where you're at, I want to say that this is a wonderfully encouraging story. It really is going to be. And even though there's some self-inflicted pain in the life, God will never let go of Samson. And I want you to see that for yourself too. In chapter 14, we're told that Samson's parents didn't know that this was from the Lord. It didn't mean that the Lord had validated this marriage. Uh, he had already said what was to happen, and Samson had already willfully asked uh, uh, against that. It was a breaking of a principle that God had already given. It was a dreadful mistake. It was going to lead to a lot of pain. And, um, but God has a way of taking a foolish mistake and turn that around, taking a mess and put it into a message, and he can uh, still accomplish that uh, through his people. And we're looking at that in the story today. They go on the way to Timnah. They approach the vineyards of Timnah, and this young Timnah, and this young lion comes roaring towards Samson. I always wondered to myself, okay, he's traveling with his family, but did, um, was he lagging behind? Was he way ahead? Um, how is it that this lion attacked, and his mom and dad didn't know about it? There must have been some distance there somewhere. And um, he tore that lion, the king of the jungle, apart with his bare hands. That's the Spirit of the Lord that came upon him. Next to the Holy Spirit, that's an easy thing. But uh, to Samson at that point, I, I got to believe that he wondered, wow, I just did that. That, that just happened, right? And so sometime later, the family's returning to Timnah down that same road, it turned out to be a, a nightmare of a wedding. Um, and lots of people have great things about stories that happen at weddings. We see YouTubes that are full of cakes falling over and people slipping and off uh, things and trying to jump for the, you know, the flowers that the bride throws over and then somebody gets hurt and, and there's fighting and there's lots of things that go wrong at weddings. Um, but this is the mother of all <laughs> wedding nightmares, I'm going to tell you. The family's traveling, and they come for the wedding just outside the vineyards of Timnah. Again, Samson walks off the road, and he sees this line. He wants to check this line. Is it still there? What's the carcass look like? And he finds out there's a hive made in there, uh, in, the, in probably that rib cage in, in the carcass and in the bones of the lion, and there's honey in it. He reaches down, and he, he scoops some, and he eats it as he walks. And as he's walking, he's... he's uh, makes up this little rhyme as he probably got a little chuckle from it, right? He says, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. What an awesome riddle, right? So he rides up Timnah, and he's responsible for organizing this wedding reception. And he has to also probably pay during those days. You'd pay for the wedding garments of those who stood with you, for those who are with you, the companions. And, and I don't know about how it is with you, but if you're told there's an extra 30 guests at your wedding and you don't know that they're going to turn up, that's probably not really good news right at the moment, is it? Well, that's what he finds out. Maybe his um, wife says, you know, I, well, you know, there's 30 or 300 guests already on the Philistine side, they're sitting on the Philistine side for me, and, and all you have is like your dad and mom over here, and, and maybe, well, you know, can we give you 30 more? Can, can 30 more join you on your, on your family side? And, and of course, um, that doesn't probably make him really happy. He's thinking, how can I get out of this? How can I calm my anger with these unwanted guests? And he tells him the riddle about the dead lion. If you can answer that, he says, I'll pay for, for your, uh, your, your wedding garments. I'll, I'll pay for those clothes. But if, if you can't answer it, then you give me that many too. And he's thinking, there is no way in the world they're going to even think about being able to, to uh, solve this riddle, right? 
By the way, a little bit of free advice thrown in this morning. If you want to promote family harmony, don't play games with your in-laws about who's going to pay uh, at the wedding reception. <laughs> it's not, probably not a good idea, but this, um, of course, um, self-control and Samson is something he doesn't have much of, so this is something we could probably expect, something like this. And these wedding receptions went on for days. In verse 15, we find that these 30 guests are leaning on Samson's wife, and she's kind of, if you read this, you can paint her into being kind of a bad person, can't you? She should be loyal to her new husband. She should never give out those, those, um, those secrets about that the husband has uh, for her own gain. But before you think too poorly of this wife giving secrets of the riddle, look at what the mob of 30 guests say to her. This is, this is mob stuff. This is like, we've got your kid, and if you don't, deliver, your kid's going to die kind of thing. I mean, this is like subversive and, and, and horrible. They said on the fourth day to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle to us or we will burn you and your, hus- your fa- father's household to death. Some guests, right? Think about that poor woman. She's desperate for her life. She's desperate for her family's life. And the fourth day already, talking about ruining your honeymoon, Right? This is happening. Verse 16, Samson's wife threw herself on him, probably sobbing, you hate me. You really don't love me. It's a bit, a bit rich starting in the, in the honeymoon, but we know why, right? She's under all this, this pressure. You haven't even told me the answer, Samson. And he's furious because he lost the bet. And he's got to now pay for the tuxedos. She told. And he went off and pound for pound, he took the life of 30 Philistines. He took their clothes. He brought the clothes back to the reception. He gave them to the guests because he he can honor his uh, commitment to that, right? But then he leaves. He doesn't honor his commitment to his wife. And if that's not enough of a wedding nightmare for you, let me tell you, it gets far worse afterwards. Beginning at the uh, beginning of uh, chapter 15, he shows up at his wife's house again after all that. Okay, it's one thing to go to your father-in-law and ask permission for the, the, their hand in wedding, your, you know, his hand, daughter's hand in wedding, but to show up after he did all that and left the altar on your daughter? This guy's got guts. He arrives with a peace offering to the family. Say he's very sorry about all that's happened at the wedding. He'd very much like to kiss and make up. In fact, he's going to go to the bedroom of this guy's daughter, it says in chapter 15. So here's a guy who thinks he can walk in and out of a relationship at will, cause all kinds of trouble, all kinds of sorrow, all kinds of drama, and then come back at a moment's notice like nothing ever happened and take up right where he left off. And the father of the bride had nothing to do with it. He broke Samson the bad news. You left my daughter at the altar. In fact, I gave my daughter to one of your companions. Probably your best man, one of your guys. I gave her to him. So no longer can you have my daughter, Samson. And he was more furious than he's ever been before. And you talk about a miracle. Now, I've done a lot of hunting in my life, a lot of trapping. To catch a fox is something that uh, you can catch a a coyote from time to time, and they're really smart. To catch a fox, that's a toughie, right? He caught 300 of them somehow in the power of the Spirit. It must have been like a Noah's Ark thing. Instead of two by two, 300 of them, right? He tied them together. He set their tails on fire, and he set them across the fields of the Philistines. It was harvest time. This is what they used to feed their people and burnt the whole thing to the ground. That's incredible. What a story. This guy was ticked, and and now he was Philistine public enemy number one. The killing of 30 Philistines for at the wedding, that, that, I guess they kind of swept that one under the rug, but not when they messed with their food, right? And his own people wanted to disown him. In fact, they sent 3,000 people in chapter 15, because he was hiding in a cave now after he did that, to say, Samson, just give it up. Give yourself up. I mean, you've got 
we're getting already trounced by these Philistines, and now you're just poking the enemy again and again and again, and they are coming after you, but they're making it harder on us too, Samson. Just give yourself up. Don't you realize they're ruling over us, it says in chapter 15? Samson, you're a liability to us too. You know, he agreed to let them bind him up and bring him in. He gave it up. And then in verse 14 of chapter 15, we read again that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him again in power. He tore his ropes. He walked clean out of there. He grabbed the jawbone of a dead donkey. And remember in those days, combat was hand to hand. And he killed three or a thousand of the Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. For goodness sakes. And we're meant to actually cheer here. Here's 3,000 of God's people who put up zero resistance. And there's one man that God raised up in the power of the Spirit, and he killed 1,000 of the enemy. But you also feel a little bit confused. It's almost like there's two Samsons. There's this great military hero who takes on the whole opposing army by himself. I mean, that's a hero, right? That's someone that we would just... Pin a medal on, right? He's a, he's a courageous hero. But we don't know where to cheer for him or weep for him, do we? He can't handle himself. It's like the, um, it's like the athletes that they've got all the talent in the world and the, and the coach says, yeah, but he doesn't have it up here or she doesn't have it up here, right? They're a head case. It's not going to happen. And, and, and you kind of look at Samson like that. And it's the same pattern. At the beginning of chapter 16, he goes down to Gaza, which is the, uh, the Philistines' capital city. It's like where Goliath, David and Goliath, is where Goliath came from, from Gaza. Big people, strong people, capital of the enemy Philistines. And he sees a prostitute. Again, he goes out of control like this irresponsible fool. And he's being followed because he's the FBI most wanted list now, right? They're following him, and he keeps escaping. And as he escapes one time, he goes out to the gates of Gaza, which had to be, that's the capital city. They had to be huge, strong, thick, deep gates. He lifts them out of the ground and carries them miles down the street and dumps them off. That's incredible strength, power of the Spirit. And as if he didn't have enough Philistine women, if he had not learned his lesson yet, he falls in love with a woman named Delilah. And she was working for the FBI agents for their country. They were, they were trying to get a secret. How is this guy so strong? So she probably said something, Samson, you need to get in touch with your feelings. You need to learn to be vulnerable. If we were really close, Samson, Maybe we shouldn't keep any secrets from each other. And finally, she wore him down, and eventually he tells her his hair, if it's cut as a sign of this Nazarite calling, if my hair is cut, I'm going to lose my strength. One night when he's asleep, she cut her, his hair off. Philistines came to arrest him. He discovered to his horror that his strength was gone. He could not escape this time like he had before. And some of the saddest words in all the Old Testament are in chapter 16, verse 20. Samson did not know that the Lord left him. So the Philistines bound him up in chains. They took his eyes out. They gouged him out, and they sent him walking around this mill probably holding on to that big beam as the as the other slaves were walking this big old grist mill around and, and grinding down the, the food. Um, probably took at least another year because they had a harvest again. They had food to, to grind in the mill this year. And so we see four deadly heartbeats in a row. Eyeless, in Gaza the enemy capital, at the mill grinding out flour for the enemy with slaves, and that is a plunge to disaster. 
How can a man so privileged and so gifted and so endowed by God's strength, how can that happen to him? I want to say if you don't master your passions, your passions will master you. And that's the great tragedy of Samson's life. And for that reason, I want to end this sermon with two quick words of encouragement. First, Christ can keep you. Christ can keep you. And that takes us to the very heart of the message of the Bible. In Jude, verse 24, it says that Jesus is able to keep you from falling. There's a special grace of God that comes in Jesus Christ and knowing Jesus Christ. There's a special grace of God that teaches us that we can say no to our worldly passions, the desires of our flesh, that can bring us into a place where we're self-controlled, one of the fruits of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, being self-controlled. And it's not just someday in heaven. It's this present age. Whatever the temptation, we do not need to fall. And the problem for some of us is we simply don't believe God. We're believers that we don't believe God has said this to us. Oh, it's so strong, Pastor Dave. I can't overcome it. And I want to say to you, it might be difficult But God can help you manage areas in your life. He can put these issues behind you. It's the same spirit that caused Samson to kill a lion with his bare hands and raise Jesus from the dead. You don't think the same spirit of the living God lives in you? That this is an easy task for the spirit of God. So it's the belief in God. It's the tightness to Jesus. It's people that walk away from reading God's word every day. It's people that stop praying to God in a relationship. It's people that get away from other believers and isolate themselves who are prime for the picking as the enemy looks at those who can overcome them with his passion. Victory begins when you believe God. Victory believes when you follow God, when you allow these things to soak into your mind and you practice them, and the grace of God teaches us to say no to these worldly passions. There's lots of relationships that over time, well, we'll just say it straight, some of the passions of the marriage aren't involved anymore. Maybe the wife has said to the husband, well, dad, you kind of get what you deserve and there's just not going to be any sex in our marriage anymore. Maybe the husband gets so upset about that that he would never open the door to that again. But there's always a cell phone to look at. There's always another Fliston woman that can walk her through. There's always another passion. And I want to say to you in your marriage, women, you can't do that to your husband, and husband, you can't do that to your wife. These are passions that are given by the evil one into your relationship. They're not the passions that God designed for your relationship. And the Spirit of the living God can heal those things. The Spirit of the living God can fix those things. And the Spirit of the living God can get you to learn to say no to those passions that are crushing your relationships. Jesus came into the world like Samson for a special thing. He was set apart to make it possible for you to live a a godly life, to say no to those passions that aren't godly. Christ can keep you. And lastly, he can restore you. Not only keeps you, he restores you. You're not to live a life of shame and guilt. You move on. You let God heal you. You let God keep you. And then you let Christ restore you. And that's the end of Samson's story. It's one of the most beautiful verses in all of the Old Testament. He's bound around in chains. He's walking around in circles day after day down in probably some damp basement with slaves in in the the enemy's capital of Gaza, for goodness sakes. And we're told in, in verse 22, 
this beautiful statement, the hair on his head began to grow again. I guess they kind of forgot about that, didn't they? There's no power in growing hair. But in that sign was his power. And the scripture says the hair on his head began to grow again. I think that's beautiful. There's some prospect of some future usefulness. There's some prospect of some hope coming. The hair on his head began to grow again. And because he's taken this plunge to disaster, God just left him there, right? No. God is still right there with him. He still set him apart. There's still salvation for him. Even here, Christ can keep you. Christ can restore you. So if Christ can, can, can restore you, then when your husband and when your wife and when your friends make one motion to try to better things, you give them grace. You give them understanding and forgiveness. You don't take the past and throw it in their face anymore because God doesn't do that. You move on. Oh, it's easier said than done, Pastor. I get it. Bitterness hurts. Um, resentment hurts. Cheating hurts. It hurts. But I'm saying that God keeps you, but God restores you. And there's some discussion with Christians, as you know, is what restoration should look like. Someone has fell into temptation. They betrayed the congregation. They betrayed their people. They betrayed their family. They, they went with a prostitute in Gaza. And what, what does restoration look like for a man like that? Look what they did. And I think the story of Samson helps us here. Because God hasn't left them, neither should we. The Philistines decide to have this party. This party is for this, this god of the Philistines named Dagon. I love that. Of all the names they can pick, Dagon. It's a good one, isn't it? You can even say it with some, Dagon. You know, you can say it with some oomph in your voice. It's a, it's just a, it's a, it's a, a, a pitiful god, but to them he was big. And they throw this party for Dagon. Why? Because Dagon delivered them from Samson. Dagon took the God of Israel and made him small because now they've captured Samson. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to have this party and all the people, all the brass, all the people that ran the military, all the religious leaders of their time, all the, the military leaders of their time, they're all at this party. Let's bring Samson up from the dungeon. Let's look at him, see what his gouged out eyes and his weak, frail body looks like now. Let's see what the God of Israel is like. We're going to poke at him. We're going to make fun. Maybe they even gave him some steel to try to bend, and he couldn't anymore. And they laughed. Who knows? But they're having this party. And once again, his hair was beginning to grow. And he felt the Spirit of the Lord move in him. Read the story for yourself later when you get home today. And he says to the servant boy, he says, can I go lean against that pole? And it's probably almost like, I'm so tired from walking around that gristmill. Can I at least lean against the pole? And he let him. So he goes against that pole. And he says in chapter 16, verse 28, Sovereign Lord, he prays, remember me and strengthen me just one more time. He was repenting. He was asking God for help. God heard him. God restored him. God strengthened him. And he said to the one, put me next to that pole. And he did. Samson pushed with all his might, and he brought the whole place down on himself. And he wiped out the command control of the entire enemy in one false swoop. It would be like one of us sending one of our children to the military or to the police and our child dies. It's a horrible, horrible thing. But they're a hero. They're a hero for God's people. They're a hero for our country, for our city, for our state. And here's what he did. He brought the command central to a halt killed them all, and he died in the event. And all of that points forward to this deliverer of a greater gift and more noble person than Samson. Jesus was mocked, and his death pulled down the entire command and control center of our great enemy. 
And on the third day, he rose again to lead his people out of oppression into the freedom and victory that Jesus Christ gives us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He died to keep us. He lives. Or he died to save us. He lives to keep us. And he restores us. You may say, I've been such a fool. And I'm here to tell you from God himself this morning that whatever you have done, whatever the dark place that you have brought, you've been brought here today with, there's a redeemer, there's a deliverer, and there is grace, and Christ will restore you. It's only offered in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, Lord, as we yet read another one of your amazing stories of your world, that's more than a story. It's a real life thing. It really happened. We learn from it that, Father, no matter what our passions lead us to do, no matter what temptation that we're led to and give in to, that, Father, you can keep us and you can restore us. And we thank you for that today. I ask for each and every family that's listening on social media today and each and every family that's represented here today, that as you think about the personal stories and what the Spirit has applied in your life about one of these things, that, Father, you heal those things that, Father, you create a great change in each one of these families, that you give the spirit of our flesh no power, but the spirit of our God all the power. That causes us to say no to those worldly passions and temptations so that as we're set apart as Christians, we can go out into the great mission field after the service and reach those that for Christ and not have to feel guilty that our lives are not in order because the old is gone, the new has come. I pray all these in Jesus' precious name and all God's people say, amen. Stand with us to sing our song of response. Lord, I need you.
friends, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my Oh God, how I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So as I was preaching today, I'm looking out in the congregation, and I see that um, each one of these graduates uh, went to a place to sit that was next to their parents or family. And I want to say to your families, a job well done. I know, because my children are out of the home now, that it took a lot. It took a lot of running around. It took a lot of encouragement. It took a lot to parent these children. And now they're becoming not children anymore, even though we're always going to be our kids, right? They're moving on. And that's hard. But I want to say from your church, thank you to you too. Thank you for what you have done in the lives of your children, how you have raised them up, you have given them their foundation, and may it be that they take that foundation and follow Christ. People have got to know that today. There may be in our congregation and those who are listening someone who is right on the edge of making a very foolish decision. Their worldly passions have led them to a spot where they are right at the precipice. They believe God, but maybe they haven't followed Jesus. They believe God, but maybe the Holy Spirit has not been asked in repentance to help them. And they're right on the edge. And one next decision can plunge them to disaster. And I want to say that doesn't have to be to you. In the hearing of God's word today, you have heard what Christ can do for you. I want you to think right now about how you will hurt your family and your community and your job, because people don't think about that when they're thrown in their worldly passions. I want you to think about that in the power of your spirit, what you are doing, and think about what you can do to just stop and say no and run the other way. It's as easy as taking a deep breath, putting the tongue on the top of your mouth and say, no, that's what it comes out when you breathe out in the power of the Spirit. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his strength. And all God's people say, amen. I would like the graduates to follow me out today so we can congratulate them after the service. I just want to say congratulations to the graduates. Uh, you're dismissed, and we're going to sing where I will follow. You're dismissed. go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. 
In this life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. All your ways are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone, in you alone. When you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. When you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. In this life, I lose. I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you.